today we're going to have a, a kind of a bit of a mashup between the W3C and the AEF and uh, actually the impact's gone quite widely and, and if you are new to Open Active, welcome. Uh, I think I recognise most of the people on the call though. Um, and we're going to talk, have a show and tell, we're going to talk about what we're doing to uh, kind of stabilise Open Active's core infrastructure. Um, I'm going to do a bit of a, uh, an introduction to the work and then I'm going to hand over to Nick from Imin who is going to tell you about what, what we're actually doing in, in this space. So um, just a bit of background to get us started. So um, as, as everyone should know, um, the Open Data Institute uh, has a grant agreement with Sport England to steward Open Active. Um, and we're currently in an extension to the fifth round of funding that we've had from uh, Sport England to do that stewardship. Um, and in that extension period, we've got five work streams um, aiming to look at different aspects of Open Active and, and, and to support the initiative. Uh, and uh, it's one of those work streams is the infrastructure work stream. Uh, and we've got four kind of key aims for that work stream during the extension. So first of all, we want to make it as easy as possible for data publishers and consumers to implement Open Active. We want to move some of the barriers that we people tell us about when they're trying to implement Open Active. We want to make that journey through the implementation process as simple and smooth as possible. Um, we want to make sure that Open Active's data infrastructure is uh, really robust and that it's easy to use. Um, we think it's really important that the infrastructure is stable, um, that it's maintainable, um, and that we understand how we're going to develop that infrastructure in the future. Um, we, we want to get to a point where Open Actives it can be maintained as an open source initiative. And I think Nick's going to talk a little bit about what that means when he takes over. Um, uh, and I think one of the things that we need to do to enable that is stabilize the infrastructure to enable it to be maintained and to be able to be and provide a strong platform for continuous improvement. Um, we have on, on the automatic risk register, um, there are some risks around the infrastructure. Um, uh, and one of the key risks is actually the, the pool of people who maintain open active is exceptionally small. Um, arguably, it's one person, but I think it's not quite that small. Um, and what we want to do is we want to make it through the work that we're doing with I'm in this year, we want to make it so that anyone who is suitably skilled is able to effectively contribute to and maintain the core infrastructure that underpins Open Active. Um, we, we did some work in phase five um, uh, and we're building on that work we did in phase five. So in phase five, we, we basically did with I mean, we basically did a big analysis of all of the outstanding issues on, on with the core infrastructure. Um, and through that work, I mean, created a really big backlog of issues that required action. Um, and within that backlog, issues were consolidated, uh, multiple issues emerged. Uh, they were classified into uh, to understand what they impacted on and uh, how, the, how they need to be resolved. Uh, they were prioritized and really importantly they were sized so we understood could have start to understand the cost of solving some of these issues and resolving them permanently uh, the, the other thing that we did in that phase was we had quite deep discussions about how we would resolve the issues um, and i think there were basically three resolutions for, for issues that we kind of agreed on so the first one uh, was essentially about minimizing the infrastructure so actually in in the, in the infrastructure there was, there was quite a lot of redundancy there were quite a lot of artifacts that are no longer required they were developed for a specific purpose they that, that purpose isn't needed anymore or, or they were uh, not iterated uh, or they were replaced so so i think there's a load of stuff that we can get rid of uh, the second thing we wanted to do was um update documentation uh, wherever possible so actually what, what, what does an artifact do? Why was it created? How does it fit in? Uh, what else does it, what's it dependent on? Uh, what's dependent on it? Um, uh, how, how was it built? How should it be maintained? So, so there is a need to improve documentation on some of these things. Um, we also recognize though that actually sometimes it might be quicker just to make a change rather than improve documentation. So there's no point in documenting something that can be resolved with a really simple code fix. So that our second, uh, uh, our third method is 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 is, is making changes to, to the code base. Um, and then lastly, uh, there are probably some issues on the list that are quite low priority that we're not going to have an opportunity to look at with the resources that we've got available. So actually, making sure those are really clearly documented so that 
future maintainers can understand what the issues are and then can tackle them in, in, in a constructive way is really important. So, so that's basically the approach that we are trying to take uh, with, with the work that we're doing with IMIN. So IMIN have this long list of issues. They will either do some archiving, they will fix the documentation, fix the code, or make sure the issue is properly documented so it can be fixed by someone else in the future. And at that point, I'm going to hand over to Nick, who can talk a bit more about what he, he's been doing and how this is working in reality. Nick. Oh, thanks, Andrew. Um, are you able to, to go through the next couple of slides? And then before I switch to my screen, that would be so helpful. Um, there are lots of words on this slide, but I realized because this is recorded, sometimes it's actually just helpful to share all the content um, when people are skipping through stuff. So I uh, don't worry about reading it. I'll talk to it um, or around it. Um, what is open active infrastructure? So the the first thing to say, I suppose, is that open, act for the, open active infrastructure is, is broader than just um, the feeds, things like that, um, uh, that maybe people see on the surface. Um, the four components here um, that we've we've used to describe open active infrastructure kind of hope, hopefully will give you some sense of what we're talking about. And then what I'll aim to do is uh, demo a little bit of the stuff that's visible. There's a lot of stuff under the surface. So what I'm going to try and do in the next few minutes is give you the kind of visible tip of the iceberg that's not um, super technical, um, but hopefully gives you a, a flavor of the kind of thing that we're doing here. Um, and I'll I'll go through an order of these these points. So we'll we'll touch on uh, one of each of the four um, in in the in the demo. Um, so registries first of all, there's a status page which I'll show you, and there's an activity list editor, or more broadly, um, SCOS vocabulary editor. Um, and those are um, important because Open Active centrally maintains those lists, the lists of all the feeds basically, and the list of activities and other such lists. They're things that Open Active maintains itself. Um, as a, a kind of core function. Um, if um, those things break, then other services break. That's why they're important um, and they'll break in potentially real time. So it's important that those things are robust, uh, are managed well, uh, that, that we've had issues before where an activity list um, was taken offline because of um, you know um, developer error and had an impact on a number of activity finders and, and um, service outages and all that kind of thing. So we, we want to put um, things around uh, these um, registries to make sure that it's it's not easy to um, break them, basically, uh, in order that it can be maintained effectively. Um, tooling. So we've got things like the validator, the test suite, the reference implementation. Um, the validator is what you use to check that someone's feed is uh, as it should be, conformant to the standards. Um, the test suite is um, something that checks for a, a deeper dive into the feeds and also uh, bookability of the um, of the implementation. And the reference implementation is um, the ideal, well, uh, an example of an ideal um, build of something that's that's um, integrated open active um, as a, a data publisher. And so they're, they're really helpful for if anyone is building something, basically, if they're gonna if they're gonna build open active into their system, follow to the test suite reference implementation of what's used um, for doing that. Um, the libraries, so this is where someone is um, building open active into their system. This gives them a kind of leg up in that process. So helps them to build things um, quicker. A lot of the heavy lifting has been done for them in these libraries, so they can kind of take them and use them like plug into their system and then that should make it cheaper to implement open active, which ultimately lowers the barrier to entry. Um, and finally, documentation, as Andrew mentioned, um, making sure that it's clear um, documentation for developers who are implementing open active, but also, and I'll come on to show you, the focus is on making sure that anyone can pick up and maintain open active. And that's slightly different to developing um, something that that is compliant with open active. Because open active, as you can see here, is a, is a bunch of things that are actually nothing to do with the systems that have implemented the, the code. Um, so it's important that the documentation is um, uh, reflects that and is suitable for those other audiences. So if we can give you the next slide, yeah. Um, why is this so important? I think it's really important to say this, and I, I think this is probably helpful if you know as as uh, the years go by and the open active continues to be maintained. 
um, to be realistic about the maintenance cost of something like this. So, um, and this isn't this isn't uh, my opinion. This is something that is um, is uh, has come from that uh, uh, the working in public um, uh, book that um, as as includes a bunch of studies and references. Um, one of the things that was really interesting to see in there, um, and is probably something that everyone thinks maybe intuitively, but just as evidence, is that um, maintenance software needs maintenance. It's not like um, I don't know what, what an example of something that wouldn't need maintenance is, because um, uh, most things do. Even if you have a shed in your garden or a lawnmower, you need to maintain it, or a car, you need to maintain it. I mean, most things do need maintenance. Um, I suppose it's not like a painting, maybe, maybe even that needs maintenance. But you know what I mean? Where it's done, the art is created, and then it just sits on the wall, and you, you touch it again for you know 30, 40 years. Um, software is more like a car; it requires that maintenance to keep it on the road, keep it working. Um, it will wear in parts if it's not maintained. And so uh, it's important to be aware of that because, because we've built Open Active and the stuff we've built is there, but it will degrade if it's not maintained. Um, two types of maintenance costs, the marginal costs, which is when people find um, bugs and things like that, uh, to fix those bugs, to make sure that any gaps that are found in the software are um, are, are dealt with somehow, either by explicitly out of scoping something so that everyone's aware of what to do with that, or they're included and added in as a new feature. Um, and there's also the temporal costs, which are the software is moving. All software is moving, constantly evolving. You've probably seen all this, the AI stuff around at the moment. Um, but there's, there's always new stuff in software and the old stuff doesn't work anymore. If anyone's had an iPhone from like, you know, iPhone 5 or iPhone 4, you'll notice they don't work anymore. It's exactly the same with this. Um, the reason the iPhone stops working is because the software goes out of date. It's the same with Open Active. It will stop working if it's not maintained. Um, and so they require, requires updates to keep it um, up to date with the ecosystem around it. As all software moves forward, Open Active needs to move forward with it. Um, and interestingly, 42% uh, of the developer time for the company Stripe, which is a payment gateway, is spent on maintenance to give you a sense of the scale of the need here. This isn't a small thing. This isn't like, oh yeah, well, someone can spend one day a week on it for, you know, and that will be enough. Um, it does need dedicated resource. Um, and if, if that doesn't happen, then the software will degrade and it will it will not become, it will not be usable. Um, so that's the next, that's this next slide. Um, so three, uh, just quickly to give you a sense of uh, these, these definitions, um, the three types of um, technical users that will interact with the software, with the, the, with the infrastructure. Um, starting at the bottom, you've got users. They're the people that will build open active stuff. So someone that wants to go and build open active into their system, that's a user. They will just have a very light touch experience with some of this stuff. They'll use the validator, they'll use the test suite, they'll use the documentation. They'll go in, they'll build their stuff and they'll they'll get out. Ideally, as quickly as possible, you know, within a few weeks, they'll go in, use it and leave. That's the user. Contributor, um, are, those are folks that are a little bit more involved. Um, and we've been fortunate in Open Active to have a number of contributors over the years. Um, and they will do more than just use it. They will suggest changes. They may fix bugs. They may contribute things. But the contributors generally don't have a sense of all of the infrastructure. They just have a very narrow view of the thing they're working on. So they might fix a bug, but that fix might not work properly. You know, they might um, notice that there's a puncture in the tire and replace the whole wheel with a square wheel and the wheel doesn't work in the car, um, but they have replaced the puncture effectively. So the job of the maintainer is to... Um, contextualize that. So if the if the contributor says, look, I've just added a square wheel, isn't that great? The maintainer can say, thank you so much for your contribution. Really appreciate that you've done that. Actually, in this case, round wheels are what we use, um, but you know, maybe we can work together on making this, this round, something like that. Um, because the best intentions of a contributor without all that context don't necessarily translate into something that's useful. And so that is the maintainer. The maintainer, um, the number of maintainers, um, usually in open source software, there are you know two or three maintainers. Some of the big projects um, that are used, there are only a handful of maintainers. Um, so it's kind of like a, um, a pyramid, if you like. Lots of users, lot, uh, many contributors, and a few maintainers. 
Um, so we're not expecting the maintainer pool of open active to be large, especially considering the, te the technical expertise in the sector in general compared to other sectors, um, just because of the shape of the sector, there's less tech folks around. Um, and so that we don't expect this to be a large pool, but we do want to make sure that the people that are engaged in this uh, are able to maintain effectively if they're if they're able to do so. And um, there's lots of ways of splitting out who maintains what. But that should give you a sense of the primary audience for this work is really that top maintainer to make sure that they're able to pick th things up and use them. Um, and so um, and if you just jump to the next slide, uh, and that's because um, with good documentation, users become contributors and contributors become maintainers. That's the idea. That's how you get people involved. So you start out thinking, I just want to build open active stuff. And then you think, oh, actually, I quite like um this i've started to notice some bugs and change and and fix some things and then you um start to take more ownership over things um and um, nathan on the call is a good example of a maintainer who has come through that exact uh those steps started out building uh, then went to contribute and is now maintaining um the php uh repositories that are in the the open active um code base um, um and uh if if uh, open source has funding or sponsorship, that usually goes towards maintainers. Um, sometimes uh, maintainers contribute, as in Nathan's case, because there's a reciprocal business interest in that. That's how Google contributes to a bunch of open source projects, as others do. So there's a corporate case for that. Sometimes businesses effectively sponsor it. In this case, that's what Playfinder is doing. Um, but in 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 other cases where there is funding um, for specific work. Um, and that generally is where it doesn't align with any of the businesses' interests that are engaged um, in directly, then it's the maintainers that are funded, the contributors and users generally are not. So that gives you a sense of kind of where we're going here in the future, open source um, maintainers that might get involved in this, maybe paid, maybe because of a reciprocal arrangement like with Playfinder, um, are able to fully engage. It's a whole spiel there. Um, so I think that's that the last slide, Andrew? Yes. Amazing. So if you wouldn't mind, I can just share my screen to show you some things. Oh, sorry, before we do that, is there any questions on what I've just outlined from anybody um, before we move on? Thanks for that, Nick. I've made you a co-host, so you should be able to share your screen. Super duper. Okay, so uh let me do that seamlessly and apparently stop the other screen sharing at the same time okay so that should be this can you let me know if you can see this little screen here? We can, yes. Okay, super. Right, so as I mentioned, we're gonna go just run through quickly some, some high level things, hopefully more visible. Sorry, I've started with code here. That's not, <laughs> doesn't bode well, does it? Uh, let's start with something visual. Um, and, um, and so the idea is that this isn't gonna be a super, super technical deep dive, but enough that if you are technical and you're watching or you're, um, you're present here that, um, you can get a sense of what what's what we've been doing. Um, so as I mentioned, we're going to run through this in the order of those different things on the slides uh, up earlier. Um, and I suppose before starting that, worth saying that we're about halfway through this work. So there's there's still work to do on the different things I'm showing you. They're not in the final state. Um, and um, as I also mentioned, this is kind of the, the visual tip of the iceberg of stuff that we've been doing. So it's by no means representative of everything. Um, but hopefully the more visual things that we can um, use to, to get an understanding of the kind of stuff we've been doing. Um, the, the aim of, of this, uh, I don't think I said it earlier, is, is stable state. Uh, so what that means is um, in order for a maintainer to easily start to work on something, it, it's ideal it's already working. If you can imagine a mechanic trying to fix a car, if the car isn't actually working, that, you can imagine the bill that will come back from your garage, right? It could be anything wrong with that car. There could be a lot of stuff to replace and fix. Whereas if the car is on the road and it goes in for an MOT and there's a couple of things to tweak, 
That's a different ball game. Similar with this, we want to make sure that everything is roadworthy, is running well, and therefore when the maintainer comes to fix something, they're not looking at it going, oh my goodness, we're going to need to completely rip this up and start again because it's just a mess. We want them to think, okay, I can get this. I want to, I want to contribute and I want to, I want to make some changes. Um, so the first example of that is the status page. Uh, so the status page, uh, you might have seen this already. It's It's been live for a few weeks now. Um, this is an example of something that we have um, improved the maintainability of. And so you might notice it's slightly visually different from what was there before. Um, it now includes the logos. Some of the issues and the errors are, are coming through here from um, the different um, things that it's checking. Um, but the, as an example of maintainability, this status page was previously thousands and thousands of lines of code across multiple files and multiple projects. It was actually a very complicated thing. And um, unnecessarily so, actually, because of the way that things have evolved. Uh, it was kind of a bit of a legacy. So if someone was to look at that and go, I want to make this change, actually, they would probably be confounded as the ODI's own internal team were as evidence of this for some for some months, actually even years, I think. It's been a few years since the ODI um, started to think about fixing the status page and since and, and, and haven't actually prioritized that work yet. And I think that just goes to show that even with dedicated resource, there's a barrier here. If if the thing isn't written well, that is it's difficult to get, you know, to get over. And you end up prioritizing other things just realistically. And so um, this is the new status page uh, in code. Uh, the reason I show you the code is to show you that it's 139 lines long. Um, so we've gone from massive, complicated stuff to simple and you can you can read it and obviously those non-technical people in the, on the call might think that still looks complicated um but the technical folks would probably appreciate the size of this in terms of getting your head around it um and trying to understand what's going on um one clean page of code that means you can get you can understand what's happening um and and why um is is going to be very helpful so um an example of maintainability someone wants to fix that add something they can easily have a look at that and, and, and make those changes. Um, and that's awesome that we can just get rid of all the other code that we had before. So we don't need that anymore. Put that in an archive somewhere and, and probably never touch it in the scrap heap of, use the car analogy again, scrap heap of old parts. Um, and um, so as we were doing that, we also um, took the opportunity to improve some other things. Um, and again, to make it easy for the next folks to come along to see what's going on. A challenge with Open Active has been there's some feeds that aren't visible to the community that are kind of ready, but not really. Um, and that's been a problem because not everyone's aware of that. And in terms of maintainability, it's not helpful to have information in silos. So what we've done is introduced um, a couple of new data catalogs. So what I'm showing you now is all the live data. Amazing how much live data there is in Open Active. Um, now it's, it's really, really encouraging how many feeds there are. Um, and if I scroll down to the bottom, you can see that there's also now a section of uh, preview data. This is data that's not quite ready, um, but but is usable if someone wants to pick it up and start integrating it into their products. Um, there's various reasons why it's not ready. Those those reasons um, should be found in the issues related to the, the data set. They're not all at the moment. That's more work for us to do to make sure that's well documented. Um, what the gaps are so people can see that. Uh, but generally, that's the that's the improvement we've made there. Um, and there's also some test data. I mentioned the reference implementation. That's now visible in the same way. So you can um, easily find that. Um, and all of this is available as um, machine-readable files, as well as what you can see visually here. So um, a good example. And the data catalogs have been updated. That's the machine-readable files have been updated, just to show you for um, the same. Um, so next maintainer comes along. Um, they'll be able to see the data that hasn't quite made it yet and hopefully pick up the issues on the backlog and help to move them through to, to working properly. Um, so that's the status page. Um, next, I was going to talk about the activity list, but does anyone have any questions on the status page before we move on? Well, good. Okay. The whistle stop tour continue. Um, right. What was the activity list before? Well, it was interesting. The old one, um, aptly labeled, um, had uh, 9,352 changes that had been made to the activity list in its history. Now, you might imagine that the activity list has been busily edited, but perhaps not to that extent. 
Um, so that's probably not the complete representation of what was going on there. The reason for this is we had some very, very quick and dirty emphasis on dirty automation that was adding new changes to this list of changes every day, even if there were no changes. Um, again, that maintainer comes in and thinks, goodness, what's going on here? This is not quite clear and difficult to get my head around. It takes a bit of time to figure that out. Um, so what we've done is we've actually gone through and removed all of those changes. So there's now 326 changes total over the last um, six years or how many years it's been. Um, and that um, is uh, a better representation of um, what's what's been going on. Um, we've also um, improved it so that you can see the specific changes, which I'll talk about. Um, I'm not sure why that's erroring because it shouldn't be there again anyway. Um, so the activity list, uh, as it as it was here, as it still is, um, you might recognize this page. What you've done is we've added a change log. So when you go to the change log, you can now see the releases, which are um, in GitHub of each of the changes. It automatically tells you what has been added and removed. So every time someone makes a change to the activity list, um, whoever's maintaining it, whatever committee is in charge of it at that time, um, you can see exactly what's been changed. You can see the um, author of the change. Um, and you can also, for the technical folks, you can see an associated pull request um, where those changes are uh, documented and also where you can actually go in and see the changes in the file itself. Um, and so that, that's the level of traceability that someone would probably expect coming into this project rather than going, okay, there's thousands of commits. Where do I even start here? You know, um, actually, if you look at the, um, the releases now, so the pull request now um there's there's not many there's 22 i think or something uh 22 21 different updates over the period and so it's much clearer now and those releases are all documented um and they go all the way back to the beginning of the activity list in 2018 um so again that's that gives people confidence in the process and also it's a single button press so what previously was a little bit of a complicated process to do this um, if you are a maintainer of the activity list, you can now click publish to open active. And if you press publish, if you press confirm, which I won't do now, that will export the list, create the PR, um, create the release, everything automatically. And so, um, and you'll notice I actually accidentally jumped onto the facility type list there. So that's, um, uh, and that's to uh, accidental segue into saying that previously the activity list was um, just the only editable vocabulary and everything else was done through weird spreadsheets and things that were easy to break basically um, without this level of rigor around the, ch the, the change management process. Um, and there's a number of vocabularies in open active facility types is another one. So this is now applied to all uh, lists and they will have a change log and that change log includes the releases. So this is the facility types list change log, same thing. Um, which is a, a massive improvement on what was there. Um, to take that even a step further, previously, if you wanted to create a new vocabulary in Open Active, um, which was attempted, I think, two years ago when someone um, we were talking about trying to create uh, a, a new um, disabilities, you know, um, uh, vocabulary. Um, what happened there was it was so difficult to do that everything was copied and pasted in a very unmaintainable way. Um, and therefore the new vocabulary was created, but then was left to inter, it was just left to kind of rot in the scrap heap of things. Um, and that's just an example of what was previously there and why that was unmaintainable, because that's what happened to it. Um, so by contrast, now we've got this uh, setup where there is one, um, you can see it here, um, staging environment with the vocabulary editor, and every vocabulary now has its own vocabulary editor, um, and all of those um, are um, maintained um, at the same in the same code base. So if someone makes a change to this, to this the change can be rolled out to all the editors at once. Um, and those editors are uh, set up so that they can be. Um, um, yeah, it's all it's it's basically reducing the code base by half because previously it was all duplicated. So now we've got half the stuff and it's configurable and it's serving six um, different lists where previously it was only serving two. Um, so that's um, a good example of of that and the releases. Um, any questions on activity list before I speed up a bit and cover some other things? 
do have a quick question actually um now that we've updated this is this all still available at the same um json urls yeah absolutely cool. yeah totally hopefully seamlessly i think the downtime is <laughs> like 30 seconds in the in the process but yeah that's right um Yes, uh, all the, the idea of, uh, of these changes is a lot of behind the scenes stuff that doesn't have, have an impact on the users, uh, the technical users. Yeah, that's good. Okay, super, right. So um, into the tools then. So that's giving you a sense of the kind of things we've been doing in the activity list. Um, and then, and that's the, um, the last of the registries. So onto the tooling. Um, the test suite we talked about before, um, we've made a number of changes to the test suite, um, but a lot of them are behind the scenes and probably only um, a few folks on this call will fully appreciate them. Um, things like um, properly running in Docker, better error messages, um, making sure that it runs in VS code in the little um, little window, terminal window um, uh, properly and um, and other documentation around it. But the, uh, an example to show you that's quite visual is the error messages. So previously, um, and again, some folks will have re remembered this, you have to do a lot of scrolling when you're interacting with the test suite. You are constantly going up and down a file, which is pages long. You probably were previously scrolling up and down like this um, and maybe 50 pages of results, which is quite difficult when you're trying to develop something to find out what the actual problems are. So one of the things we've done here to improve it um, which is, and again, from a maintainability perspective, something that we were able to easily do because we understand the test suite well, whereas uh, the next maintainer would find it more difficult to implement this type of thing um, because it did require some, some um, changes um, that were quite significant to do it. So now um, when you see uh, a test result, as this is an example of one, the error is displayed quite clearly and uh, everything that works is hidden. And what that means is that you've got this kind of setup here where rather than pages and pages, you've got, oh, you can see a very small surface area of things to read through. And really all you care about is why it's failing here. So you can just look at that error and, and work with that and hide all the other stuff that you previously would have to scroll past to get to that point. Um, so that's something that um, hopefully will make it a bit more, a bit, a bit nicer to work with. Um, and that means cheaper basically, because developers will spend less time scrolling, less time confused, therefore will spend less um, effort and money uh, on building things. Um, so uh, that's, that's test suite example of something that we've done there. Um, we've also done some work to the reference implementation. This is still on tooling to make sure that the feeds now have all the, the potential data in, bigger surface area of test data, which is useful for data users to make sure that they um, and test things properly, um, conscious to not put all our effort into just data publishers historically. There's been more time more time spent on that side, so we've tried to balance it and help, help on that side as well. Um, we've also done some work with validator to make sure that if a, a maintainer in the future um, changes anything, that there's proper error checking around the things they're changing to make sure that it's clear if they break something. Previously, it was quite easy to just make changes and break everything. So we've tried to do some things in the background to help with that as some examples, but I can't really show you that as easily. Um, so that's the end of tooling. Um, and I've quite quickly got documentation to cover, but does anyone have any questions on tooling before we move on? Yeah, I Great, okay. So then finally, um, uh, oh, that's uh, another example of, sorry, another example of tooling, just I think I missed this one. Uh, if you create a new scars vocabulary editor, as I showed you earlier, um, there's like a nice set of fields you can fill in. What is the what's the new vocabulary? What's the type? What's the da, 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 da. so you know your knowledge to now create a new vocabulary is really confined to answering questions on this page and pressing the button, which previously is is a whole different world to where we were before. Um, so that's the kind of idea. Um, documentation. So. Um, mentioned those three different types of users we're talking about. There's the maintainers, there's the contributors, and there's the developers. Um, and so um, developer documentation people will be familiar with already. Um, what we're doing here is we're adding these other two sets of documentation, maintainer documentation and contributor documentation, um, focused on these different audiences we mentioned. Um, so uh, the an, an example of the kinds of things we've been doing, and again, focusing on what we've just been talking about to follow through is if you want to create a new vocabulary 
uh, for Open Active, there's a guide you can go through step by step here with a deploy to Heroku button that opens up this thing um, and explains what to do. Um, and that is for the next maintainer that goes to do that. It'll be much easier for them to figure out what to do um, if they want to create a new one, um, which I don't expect there'll be anyone creating a new vocabulary this year or even maybe next year. But um, it might well be the case that that happens in the future. So um, whoever comes next will be able to figure that out. Um, and the same with, um, so that's a good example there, contributors, um, documentation. Um, a good example here is that we've now got um, an explanation of uh, what the reference implementation is, what the test suite is, how they connect together and they're kept in sync, why changing one requires changing the other. Um, we've also got information about why we are using certain programming languages, what the expectations are. If you're gonna contribute something new, contribute it in JavaScript or, or C-sharp first and foremost, um, and the reasons for that. So that it can help people to figure out what they're, what they're doing. And these are the kind of questions that we were getting even from the ODI's own, own team when they joined, uh, new, newest team when they joined, you know, why are we using JavaScript? Great question. Um, so good to have that written down so that the next folks that come along, I think it actually might be one of Darren's uh, questions. So we've answered that, Darren, it's there. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, that's that's the idea to, to help with that. Um, we've also done things like for the developers documentation, um, making sure that we've covered um, questions like large integers, um, which are uh, a problem that um, you come across if you're using open active um, in anger. Um, there are some there are some challenges with some of the um, the, the scaling of the standards, which um, you only really come across if you start doing things, um, you know, in in uh, at, as I said, at, at scale. Uh, and so this is trying to explain that to the next person that comes along and wonders why things break uh, at a certain point of scale. Um, and we've got the detail of what to do and, and, and approaches to fixing that in there as well uh, so that those developers can implement properly um, whatever that, if they're, if they're going to consume data. Again, trying to balance the, the, date, the additions to the documentation across data publishing and data use. Um, so, is there anything else I haven't covered? Uh, yeah, I think that's, there are, um, we haven't done as much on the libraries at, as of yet. We focused on the other three uh, more so, um, uh, except that we have um, the improvements to the reference implementation do also improve the .NET library. Um, so there has been some changes there, but we haven't done much in the other, other languages, although there is more to do there. So that's just, um, a bit further down the backlog. Um, so that's uh, that's it. I've rushed through the end there, and now I've got more time than I thought I had. So that's. <laughs> um, but does anyone have any any questions on any of the, the documentation stuff that we've just um, just talked about? Oh, that's that's great. Thank you, Nick. Uh, I think it's a really helpful run through, and hopefully people. Uh, can see and appreciate that the work that you're doing is, is as you say, stabilizing open active and making it more maintainable for the future. Um, so does anyone have any questions for, for Nick or for the ODI team at this point? Okay, cool. If, if there are no questions, then I think that probably we can probably close the call. The, the, the plan going forward is that uh, Nick and the team are going to carry on uh, delivering this work. I think we're anticipating it finishes uh, July, August time from memory. And I think the plan is that we'll do another show and tell at the end of the project so we can update people on what we've done in the second half of the work. Um, thank you ever much, uh, very much to everyone for joining today, for giving us your time. Uh, it's nice to see you all. Um, we will be having an AF meetings and the W3 W3C meetings on the, the normal Wednesday schedule going forwards, um, and I look forward to seeing people at those. So thank you very much for your time today, uh, and we'll see you all soon.